Good morning. I'm Chandra Pazma, MPP for Ottawa West Nepean and education critic for the NDP. And I'm joined this morning by JB West, Jamie West, MPP for Sudbury and labor critic for the NDP. Monique Taylor, MPP for Hamilton Mountain and NDP critic for children, community and social services. Uh, Kristen Wong Tam, MPP for Toronto Centre. Shauna Heath, an education worker and OSSTF member. And Amy Boyack, an education worker from COPE Local 527. Also joining us this morning is leadership from unions representing education workers and teachers. Gabrielle Lemieux, la présidente de l'Association des enseignants et enseignantes franco-ontariens. Karen Brown, president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. Joe Tagani, president of the Ontario School Board Council of Unions. Melina Lay, vice president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Sherry Ann Bowen Gordon, executive member of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, and Susan Lusek, president of COPE Local 527. We are here this morning because we are now two months into the school year and the government has done absolutely nothing about the violence which continues to be a daily concern in our schools. Every day across the province there are workers who are going to work in a school in full body protective gear like what we see here this morning. There are children who are so used to seeing their educators wear this type of equipment that they don't even comment on it at home. Workers shouldn't have to wear military grade protection to a classroom. Students shouldn't experience this level of violence as normal. This is preventable. I want to be very clear. No one here is blaming students for this violence. Doug Ford has made significant cuts to education funding. $1,500 less per student means larger class sizes, fewer education assistants, fewer resource teachers, fewer special education supports, a lack of mental health supports, and safety plans and independent education plans that exist on paper only. The violence in our schools is the direct result of the lack of supports. It is the result of unmet needs. An unsupported child is a frustrated child. We cannot set children up to fail and then punish them for it. We need to set children up for success. And that means taking action to provide every child with the supports they need and to prevent and eliminate school violence. Six weeks ago, we were all here to call on the government to take urgent action and implement an emergency plan to end school violence. Doug Ford and Jill Dunlop have failed to act. Their government is completely ignoring the needs of our children and our children's safety. They are ignoring the working conditions of education workers, teachers, and principals. And they are ignoring the impact of school violence on our children's education and their right to learn. They could take steps today if they wanted to. They don't even need to come up with a plan. We've done that for them in consultation with workers in the sector who are living this every single day. That's why today, MPP West and I are tabling a motion calling on the government to implement our emergency plan to end school violence. Doug Ford and Jill Dunlop may not care about our children's safety, but we invite every MPP who does care to support this motion. Nous sommes ici ce matin parce que le gouvernement de Doug Ford ne fait rien pour adresser le problème de violence qui touche nos écoles chaque jour partout dans la province. Chaque jour, il y a des travailleurs et travailleuses en éducation qui vont à l'école habillés de la tête aux orteils en équipement de protection. Il y a des enfants si habitués à voir leurs éducateurs habillés comme ça qu'ils ne disent rien à la maison. Il n'est pas inévitable que les choses se passent ainsi. Nous pouvons faire autrement. Mais nous avons besoin d'action et Doug Ford et Jill Dunlop ne font rien. C'est pourquoi le député West et moi déposons une motion aujourd'hui qui demande au gouvernement de mettre en œuvre immédiatement un plan d'urgence pour mettre fin à la violence aux écoles. Doug Ford et Jill Dunlop ne se soucient peut-être pas de la sécurité de nos enfants, mais nous demandons à tous les députés qui s'en soucient de soutenir cette motion. And with that, I will turn it over to MPP West. Thank you, Chandra. 
Uh, my name is Jamie West. I'm the MPP for Sudbury, and I'm the Labour Critic for the Ontario NDP. I spent 10 years in construction and almost 20 years in mining. and We would not put up with this in those fields. All Ontario workers deserve a safe workplace, one that's free from violence and free from harassment. This is enshrined in law. It's in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which protects workers against health and safety hazards in the workplace. In June of 2010, it was, this act was updated to include violence and harassment as potential hazards within the workplace. You fast forward today, we've gone by 24 years, and teachers and education workers are second only to police and firefighters in filing workplace claims. 77% of ETFL members have personally experienced or witnessed violence against an educator. In 2022-23 alone, there were 4,000 reported incidents of violence in just one school board. Workplace violence is defined in the Occupational Health and Safety Act as the use of physical force by a person against a worker in a workplace that causes or could cause physical injury to the worker. And every employer and supervisor in our province has a legal responsibility to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances to protect a worker. However, our school boards, they can't do this because they don't have the money. After inflation, per student funding for education in Ontario is still $1,500 per student, lower than it was in 2018, lower than it was when Doug Ford was elected. This isn't the student's fault, it's not the parent's fault, it's not the education worker's fault. Let's be clear about this, this is Doug Ford's fault, because Doug Ford puts them second. Tous les travailleurs de l'Ontario méritent un meilleur de travail sécuritaire. Nos éducatrices et éducateurs passionnés se présentent chaque jour en voulant faire de leur meilleur pour nos enfants. Il ne devrait pas avoir à subir du plaisir physique ou psychologique en faisant de ce travail. Il ne devrait, devrait pas avoir à se présenter une veste Kevlar. Le gouvernement Ford doit intensifier le financement et les modifications réglementaires pour s'assurer qu'il reste en sécurité au travail. I'm going to end this the way I started. Every worker in Ontario deserves a safe workplace. It's a legal requirement. Our education workers show up every day wanting to do the best they can for our children. They shouldn't have to suffer physical or psychological injuries for doing that work. They shouldn't have to show up in Kevlar. The Ford government needs to step up with the funding and the regulatory changes to ensure that these workers stay safe at work. The workers deserve it, the parents deserve it, and our children deserve it. Thank you. I'm going to ask Shauna from OSSTF to come up next. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shauna Heath, and uh, I'm a child and youth worker. I'm proud to be a child and youth worker. As a child and youth worker, my main duties are to establish a trusting and meaningful relationship with the individuals and the families that I work with that I support and that I advocate for. Imagine a scenario where I'm alone in a room and have to manage a student that's in crisis, a physically larger student. I have to de-escalate this crisis. It's not a hypothetical situation. It's, it's my Tuesday. And even though I work in an elementary school, my student is 6'5". He's 250 pounds and he's 19. That's my reality. A reduction in support staff will lead to heightened stress for workers. Managing this alone creates workers, creates, sorry, alone places students and workers at risk. This isolation leads to feelings of helplessness, burnout, affects the, the worker's mental health and their job performance placing a strain on the relationship between student and worker. Low staffing creates an environment where the needs of the student, especially those in special education, cannot be fully met. Individualized attention is not possible. This leads the student to feel unsupported and increases the likelihood of acting out. Imagine being a parent entering a special needs school and you see the staff in padded arms, gloves, a helmet, and a jacket. I'm telling you it's for safety, for protection, at a school. I've been a child and youth worker for over 15 years and I love my job. 
But as behavior analyst Greg Hanley has stated, safety is a top priority, but safety has never been found in padded rooms, padded arms, and in helmets. That's not safe. That's preparing for it to be unsafe. Lastly, I am a mom, and my son has witnessed the euphoria of a well-staffed team and the joy that we can have with our students. But he has also witnessed his mom, sorry, come home with injuries and bruises and in a cast. And despite this, he also wants to be a child and youth worker. Sorry, because he knows that the advocacy for our students, our families and our co-workers is what we do and who we are. Put the money back where it belongs in a safe education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna, for sharing your experience. And we can really see your passion for children shine through. Next, I would like to turn it over to Amy Boyack, an education worker and member of COPE Local 527. Good morning. I became an educational assistant because I wanted students with disabilities to have the same opportunities as their peers. I wanted to see them grow and learn and be successful in life. Over the years, I've had many injuries, some worse than others. In 2018, a student held my shirt with one hand and punched and kicked me. It took three staff members to get him off of me. I ended up needing time off for my injuries and was scared to go back to work, and I never thought I'd be scared to do my job. My therapist was concerned and wanted me to take more time off, but I couldn't. I knew my students needed me and that my coworkers were picking up the slack from my absence because there weren't enough supplies to do the job. 20 years ago, I worked with one child. Educational assistants now help four to eight children at a time. Children's needs are not being met. A regular classroom can be overwhelming, causing our most vulnerable students to become dysregulated and lash out. They may self-harm or hit other staff and students. It becomes more dangerous when there's not enough supports in place to help these students. I am constantly dealing with violent behaviors. Instead of helping students with their academics, I walk through the halls in full body protection, arm guards, leg guards, chest and head protection. I often must hide my gear so students can't see it there because at times I have become the target of the violence and they kick me more. While I am appreciative of this equipment, it does leave me vulnerable to the violence and students can be triggered. Wearing protective equipment has also caused some health issues, overheating to the point of almost fainting, especially working in non-air conditioned buildings. I had heat rashes and ringworm despite my gear going home and washed regularly. I resorted to wearing tights under my shin guards to help prevent reoccurring outbreaks, which contributed to overheating. It was a vicious battle to stay cool and healthy. Premier Four needs to provide more funding to hire more staff so that we can support our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for sharing your experience with us. And with that, we'll open it to questions. So I see some of you are wearing your gear. Can one of you sort of describe what it is and what you would what it would be protecting against? So oh, I have here, Amy, in front of the microphone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I have my shin guards on, which I hide with my pants, so that um, if a student kicks me, my legs are protected. I still do sometimes get bruises, but it's not as bad. Um, I have my gear on here. There's padding here all along my arms, separate arm guards that go over top to prevent hits, bites, if children kick high enough. Um, the padding does go around my back as well. And I'm wearing a bump cap for children who hit in the head um, or if projectiles are being thrown at me. Shauna, would you like to share? It's just, I mean, we wear them, but they're not effective. The coat, because it's so big, regardless of the size that you get, just makes it easier for you to be held on to. The bites go through our padding despite wearing the arm guards and the jacket. So it doesn't stop it. It just prevents less. It doesn't protect your face. It doesn't protect anything else. My knees have been fully skinned down because there's no padding for that. You know, if you fall, there's no padding for your tailbone. All of these things, they don't help and they're not preventative. So it's provided depending on your board. Um, so we do this type of training called CPI, which basically helps us to reduce the risk in the school. And so sometimes it's provided by um, those 
uh, instructors, but it's paid through schools. So if you work in a school such as I do, that's higher needs, we go through equipment pretty often and our school doesn't have the money to keep that up. So private members' motions very, very rarely ever pass. So I don't, I don't, I probably don't expect this one to either, but if it doesn't, if the PCs vote against it, what does that tell you as like education workers? Okay. Malini Lehi, OSSTF. This is a bill that protects every worker and every worker in Ontario has a right to work in a safe environment. And I would expect that every person would support keeping workers safe. Everybody deserves that. If this government chooses not to support that, I think the message is clear. So this is off topic, but it is since we have people from education unions here, uh, Jill Dunlop was talking to reporters here yesterday and she as when we she was asked whether she is willing to make some sort of like reforms to the way that school boards are run in Ontario after this whole thing with um, I guess kids going to that Grassy Narrows protest and the uh, Catholic school board going to Italy to look for art to buy we she said nothing is off the table when it comes to making reforms or changing some the way school boards are run and I'm just wondering what you guys think of that idea as does that concern you that we're getting to this point. I would love to hear from anybody from the unions as well from Andra. Um, thanks for the question, Alan. I'll start and then I'll turn it over to anyone who would like to speak. So obviously there's great concern if school boards are spending money on trips to Italy and $100,000 worth of art. Um, but Jill Dunlop would rather talk about these uh, isolated but egregious examples because she doesn't want to talk about the dire straits that she has put the vast majority of school boards in across the province. These school boards are being forced to cut to the bone. There is nothing left to cut that doesn't have an impact on our children and on our classroom resources. They are cutting supports for children with special needs, even though we know that those children are already in an unsafe position when they go to school in the morning, uh, let alone receiving any learning supports. We know that there are larger class sizes where children aren't getting the supports they need to learn. We know that student transportation is in chaos, and yet school boards are being forced to cut that. Uh, if Jill Dunlop really cared about the edu education of our children and the performance of school boards, she would be making sure that the funding was there so that every child in Ontario could receive a high-quality education with the supports that they need. Okay, and Gabrielle, Lucy. Uh, Karen Brown, President of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in 2023, we did a, a survey, a study for our members in regards to violence in the schools and the amount of witnessing of violence of our members over 70%. So this is not an, a new issue. Uh, the Ford government has had six years uh, to invest in the education system to provide the resources and support uh, that these members here have been saying that they need so that they can do the, their job. You've heard that they want to do their jobs. Our members want to be able to engage with students, but the conditions continue to be safe, unsafe and continue to deteriorate. So it's not something that's new. It shouldn't be shocking. And uh, they are behind. They need to do these investments now. They need to support this motion and do the right thing. The parents of Ontario expect this and the students of Ontario deserve it. Gabriel Lemieux de l'AEFO. Um, C'est important de consulter les acteurs en éducation. Si on est pour parler d'une réforme ou parler de réévaluer les conseils scolaires, comment ça fonctionne, il faut qu'on aille à la source puis qu'on s'assoie avec les gens qui sont impliqués puis d'avoir ces consultations-là. C'est absolument essentiel. Alors, uh, so what I'm saying is that it is so essential, it is primordial that the Minister of Education uh, sits down with the main actors in education to talk about such reforms. It can't just come from the government. It has to come from the people who are living this every day, people like Shauna on, like on, uh, in the schools that are living this. That's where the information should come from. Um, we need to stop just making all these decisions and, and statements about education without having the people in education be involved in those decisions. Would you be able to just sort of reiterate what the motion is or summarize it in like two sentences? 
So the motion calls on the government to immediately implement an emergency plan to end school violence. That covers uh, additional qualified staff in schools, uh, funding for training for all personnel who work in schools, changes to the regulations of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, an online reporting system that would create a single source uh, for understanding the level of violence in Ontario. about why do you think um, students are sort of turning to, to violence or sort of reacting in this way is it like you know different stress is a pandemic is it like what is what do you think is sort of behind uh, levels that we're seeing that are so much higher than we've seen in you know 20 years ago or I can answer from like a specific Please. point of view in front of the mic um, so regarding special education is that if there's not enough resources for parents and for staff, what's happening is incidental learning. So the coping skills that they learn at five translate to when they're 19. So if it's not an appropriate coping mechanism, then we'll see it when they are only bigger. So it's not that my students want to aggress towards me. They don't. They're amazing, amazing, amazing kids. They just don't know what else to do. And if I'm in a position where I don't have the opportunity to teach them how to do it better, how to express themselves, when they don't have language, they're vocal, but they're not verbal, or I have some that aren't verbal at all. How do I teach them if I'm trying to manage six kids in one room and they all have that type of issue? It's just, it's not possible. You need more staff. You need to be able to give them what they, they have a right to an education. They have a right to be there. And we want to help them. Thank you. Monique Taylor, MPP Hamilton Mountain, uh, official opposition critic for Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, we have stood together many times talking about the lack of supports and programs for our children, uh, particularly children with autism uh, in our communities. We have over 70,000, 73,000 children on wait list currently. Uh, we have watched for, quite frankly, decades, uh, children aging out of the system uh, without having any services or supports. These are the same children that are in our schools today uh, that are 19 uh, in the school system. And we're going to see this problem continuously get worse as we see more and more children enter our school system with zero support systems. I will also just add, it's not just children with disabilities or special needs who are reacting with violence, but we're seeing the lack of supports across the education system. So there's larger class sizes, teachers who do not have the time to spend with every child who is struggling academically. Uh, there's not enough EAs. They're running back and forth between children who need supports, often after the crisis has already erupted. There's fewer resource teachers, so kids are not getting the academic supports they need. There's not enough mental health professionals. Uh, we know that it's only one in ten who have regularly scheduled access to a mental health professional. And that means that children who ask to see a mental health professional aren't getting assistance of any kind. In all these ways that we are failing to meet the needs of our children uh, leads to frustrated children. And an unsupported and frustrated child is a child who will lash out. Karen and Gabriella, we, uh, a, another question about uh, Ms. Uh, Dunlop. Uh, Chandra asked about lead um, contamination in water yesterday, and uh, Minister Dunlop had a sort of an interesting response, sort of blaming school boards for sitting on money that should have been used for school repairs to fix that sort of issue. Does she have like a legitimate point when she says that, or is she like making out uh, school boards to be the problem when they're not? I, I will also answer that too. <laughs> we have a, a school repair backlog that we know four years ago was uh, 16.8 billion. The government has been refusing to release any update on what that number is now, which you know means the number is going up, not down. We have incredibly urgent situations with flooding, with crumbling ceilings. Uh, so the lead is one part of the many things in our schools that need to be repaired and the government is giving a fraction of that total amount. It's not even 10% of the total amount of the school repair backlog every year. So if, of course school boards can't prioritize everything. 
they cannot get to every repair that needs to be done. It is absolutely ludicrous that the Minister of Education is blaming school boards for the state of our schools when the government has so significantly underfunded repairs. Pour ajouter à ça aussi de lentille francophone, il y a du financement qui est pas adéquat au niveau du système francophone. Uh, donc, il y a des particularités dans des conseils scolaires francophones où ça va prendre du financement supplémentaire. Alors, quand on ajoute toutes ces demandes-là sur des conseils scolaires qui sont peut-être sous-financés, um, ça rajoute un, un fardeau sur ces conseils scolaires-là. Alors, uh, on the francophone side, it's, it's also, um, there's particularities to having the francophone system that needs extra funding to address those particularities. So, um, I can't speak for my, my colleagues, but on the francophone side, we, we need that extra funding to uh, offer that quality education to our students that they have a right to. Um, one example would be that uh, when anglophone schools are left behind by the anglophone school boards, that's when francophone school boards can now buy those schools that are or use those schools that are not good enough for the anglophone system, while those schools need more repairs and they might not be in the same state as some of the brand new schools. So we need to we need to look at all those aspects also. I don't think there's a one size fits all um, answer to funding for school boards. Uh, what we're seeing is the government once again uh, passing the buck, uh, blaming school boards for a responsibility that's theirs in regards to fully funding uh, the school boards. Uh, school boards, as you heard, have had to prioritize in, re in regards to where they're allocating funds, and it could be in regards to supporting programs for our most vulnerable students. And that should be something we've heard the $1,500 per pupil funding that's been reduced. Uh, this is what this government has done. We saw during the pandemic, uh, they were giving out money to, to parents for, for tutoring as opposed to putting that money back into the system to support every student. And so this is the sort of things we've heard recent announcements in regards to $200 coming to, to every household. Uh, we, we need to, a government that's going to prioritize public education and which will allow school boards to adequately uh, address the funding shortfall, not just in the, the the backlog and the repairs, but as we're here in regards to the supports and resources that are that are needed. Uh, so this this government has had six years uh, to do the right thing. Uh, they need to step up and stop, uh, you know, really passing the, the blame on to school boards. We have an early election coming, and the PCs seem to have like found these issues that they want to pursue because they think they'll resonate with their particular voters, whether it's bike lanes or sending out checks or what have you, but it does seem like, like, are you at all worried that education, like, and teachers and school boards could be one of these uh, issues? We have the education minister basically accusing school boards of wasting money and indoctrinating kids by taking them to, like, protests. And we had uh, Premier Doug Ford um, a couple weeks ago uh, now repeat that, uh, that accusation that teachers are indoctrinating students which is something he said before a year ago, but sort of held off saying again, again until very recently. So are you worried that at all that with the election coming, the PCs are going to be coming down hard on the education system, trying to make you into the enemy? What we've seen repeatedly from this government is that they will do anything to distract from their record, which is a complete failure after six years. You know, with the bike lanes, they're trying to start a culture war rather than talk about their record on health care. Uh, housing and cost of living, which is what really matters to people across Ontario. With education, we see this pattern repeatedly from Stephen Lecce when he was minister and now from Jill Dunlop as minister, that they are trying to point the finger in every direction except at themselves, uh, despite the massive underfunding that they have delivered to the system. But I think that parents are starting to see through the government's uh, falsehoods because they can see for themselves that the supports are just not there for their children. The lack of support every single day academically for students with disabilities, um, even buses showing up in the morning, uh, and it becomes impossible for the government to claim that they have no role in the outcomes for our children every day. And we, as the official opposition, will of course be reminding people every single day about this government's record and what the outcomes are for their children. I think it's important to note that you know the funding decrease since 2018 that's six years six and a bit years of 1500 per child that means that children that were in grade six are graduating this year without proper support from the schools that means that uh, when Sean Sadden reached out to me with talking about his two children who are on the spectrum that 
representing the 70,000 plus kids who are not receiving proper supports from the government, that they're being left behind for six years. That these kids in school, and, and you saw, you saw these workers, frontline workers, talking about how they're being affected emotionally, how they love their jobs and love these kids, but aren't able to give them the supports that they need. This government is failing these students and these families, outright failing them. And there was an earlier question about the recommendations that we made. And it is an NDP motion, but we didn't draft this. MPP Chandra and I weren't sitting in the back room. This is from education workers. We did a lot of consultation on it. We're echoing and amplifying their voices. This is what we need to be successful in our schools. And it isn't about us being successful as New Democrats. This is about the people of Ontario being successful, the parents, the kids, and society when these kids get out of school. That's really what we're talking about today. Everything that Stephen Lecce has said in the past, Doug Ford says, Jill Dunlop says about it is a distraction to the fact that they're failing these kids and failing these parents on a regular basis, day to day to day, with things they could address. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, I just, I, what I want to the Ford government to know, the Minister of Education to know, uh, there is an, an isolated incident that's happening and there's an investigation, but the, I represent 80, 83,000 public elementary school teachers across this province and there are other uh, education unions here who represent members who are committed to students who are doing this job because they're passionate about it. They love what they do. They want to create safe and inclusive schools but they want the tools and the resources to do that so that every student can thrive. Uh, we don't appreciate the disrespect that's happening and the vilifying of our members trying to change the narrative. We're here to talk about what's really happening in classrooms, the level of violence, the lack of supports. Children in Ontario are suffering. It's critical at a critical crisis. We know there's also a, a critical crisis in the working conditions that's happening here. Fail to fails. But we have a lot of uncertified, unqualified uh, teachers in the classroom. And that's because this government is not prioritizing good working conditions so that we can have the best people in front of our, in front of our classrooms, leading our students, engaging, as we heard from Shana and our other co uh, colleague here. Uh, that is the message, that we want a good public uh, education system. We want good public services, and we want them to put that priority and that focus on that. Let's stop distracting on the other issues. They need to make some investments, and they need to do that now. Melanie or Joe? Thanks. This government continues to want to put the focus on everyone else but themselves. But as mentioned, since 2018, there are $1,500 fewer, less per student in Ontario. And we can talk about inflation, and the government will tell you that they've invested more than any other time. But just ask yourself, when you look around in the classrooms, how many supports do you see? There are fewer supports in our classrooms. Go home and ask your kids, ask your grandchildren, how many times are your classrooms being evacuated? And then compare that to 2018. We know this government continues to fail our students and our students' learning environments are our workers' working environments. And they deserve to have safe learning environments and working environments. You know, the Conference Board of Canada came out and said that for every dollar you invest in education, a dollar thirty goes back into the economy. We need this government to invest in publicly funded education, stop shortchanging our students, and ensure that we have a viable public school system that enriches our students' lives and ensures the safety of all our members. Uh, Joe Tiani, the president of the OSBCU. So I represent 55,000 education workers. Similar stories that would be shared by our members to what's with these amazing people that are here today. Some of your questions, and I'm just gonna echo some of the comments from the people up here, it's real simple. The government has a choice. The choice is very clear, to support workers, to support education in the province of Ontario. Their record has shown over the last six years, they're not interested in that. We've had several education ministers who, as, as the comments have been, simply want to pass the buck and look to put blame somewhere else. Education workers, teachers in the province of Ontario have never been more committed in this province. That is clear, it's abundantly clear, and I think it's, it's not surprising, it's disappointing that this is the tactic and the new education minister's message seems to pick up right where the last one left off and it's disappointing, frankly, that that level of disrespect is how we started the school year.
trust, it doesn't matter what school board you go to, York, Durham, Toronto District School Board, um, Peel, for example, Bradford, changing the rules a couple of days before they get first class tickets to go to Italy. The problem is the whole system, is it not? And I don't want to be disrespectful to everyone or anyone, but when you see that sort of misspending, do you think the system should change the, the way that the, the money is allocated, distributed, and, and spent? What I think needs to change is the amount of money that is going into education. That's not going to stop first class tickets daily. That's not going to stop school boards being taken over or, or, um, because of um, improper spending. What is going to stop actually money, or what is going to start getting money into the classroom that's there now, even if it's maybe not enough? What we've seen with Brantford is a very isolated incident. Uh, Toronto School District School Board, School Board has Council, not Peel. spent any money on trips to Italy. What we've seen is the uh, Ministry of Education stepping in because school boards are unable to balance their budgets because they are making such deep cuts to the supports that children need that they cannot continue to make these cuts. We already have large class sizes. We already do not have enough educational assistants and other education workers. We cannot get school buses running on the road. The vast majority of trustees and school boards are working very hard every single day to come up with solutions that will continue to support our children despite the circumstances in which they are working. And what we need to see is the government start to do its part by providing the funding so that every child gets the resources and supports that they need every single day. Okay, but uh, it's not an isolated, Bradford is not an isolated situation. There's several school boards that have been in trouble for spending, spending habits, um, creating flagship schools and taking money from other schools to create these flagship schools. Do you not see, not see a problem there or is the systems okay as is? The system is not okay as is because we do not have the funding that we need to provide the supports for our children. We don't have the funding to provide our children with safe, healthy school buildings. We don't have the funding to make sure that every child can get to school safely in the morning. We don't have the supports to ensure that our children with disabilities and special needs are coming home safely at the end of the day, let alone receiving any supports for their learning. We do not have the funding to make sure that we can have small and reasonable class sizes where every child gets the attention that they need from their teacher. We do not have the funding that we need to provide the mental health supports that our children are telling us that they need, that they are asking for, and that they are simply not getting. We don't have the resources that we need to make sure that every francophone child in the province gets their right to a high quality education in their own language respected. So yes, there's a lot that needs to change in our education system and it starts with the Doug Ford government and the Ministry of Education who are making choices every single day not to prioritize our children. Um, so we've also heard workers speak about concerns about um, incidents involving guns, knives, like, you know, this, these types of things, which is a very different issue than, you know, special needs issues in a classroom. Um, we saw some workers, I think it was about a, a year ago, that they felt like they couldn't even go back into their high school because things had sort of gotten so bad. Do you feel that um, maybe for the, the workers, you feel that this, this motion addresses sort of that, or is that something, something would need to happen beyond that, that type of violence? Well, let me start by saying that uh, Monique was absolutely right, that this is not isolated to schools. Schools are being expected to be the backstop for the lack of supports for our children uh, in health care with regards to therapy, with regards to community programming, with regards to employment opportunities and supports. Um, what we've seen with communities that are experiencing youth violence is that they are saying those are the solutions and when those solutions aren't in place then there is youth violence and that can spill over into the schools and what we want to see is a scenario not where schools have to re respond to those kinds of incidents but where we are preventing those incidents from happening in the first place. Thank you. Yeah. L'autre défi à ce sujet-là, c'est que nos enfants sont exposés à cette violence-là. C'est normalisé dans les écoles. It's across the board. It's across the board. Every single teacher, education worker I've talked to tells me that violence is an issue. That means that our kids 
are seeing that, are witnessing that every day. So much so that they're not even talking about it anymore at home. It is normal to be taken away from their classroom to go work at the library with three other classrooms because there's three class, classes being evacuated because of violent incidents. That's what our kids are living. So for them, seeing some of this violence outside of school is going to become normal. And that is very, very worrisome. C'est super inquiétant d'avoir des enfants qui sont désensibilisés à la violence parce qu'ils le voient systématiquement à l'école, tellement qu'ils n'en parlent même plus à la maison. Alors, ça devient un problème de société, puis il faut qu'on l'adresse, puis une des sources où on peut l'adresser, c'est dans les écoles. Any further questions? Okay, thank you very much for your time this morning.